state your name, your birthday, and how long you've lived in Hernando County. My name's Elaine Alice Crum Sullivan. My birthday is March 9th, 1945, and I was born in Hernando County, so I've been here 68 years. What part of the county did you live in? So I live off of Powell Road on Crum Road. Okay, and what was it like back then? Do you have any particular memories that uh, you think sort of shaped your life growing up here in the county? Oh, absolutely. Um, where I grew up uh, shaped the kind of person that I became. Um, my family, the Crumbs and the Hopes, settled this county. And so uh, we were farmers, um, herders, cow hunters. And uh, so my whole life, I lived on a farm. And so everything I did revolved around being on a farm. So where I lived off of Powell Road was uh, pasture land and woods. And I lived on a dirt road. Uh, Powell was a narrow, little paved road. And 41 was a two-lane paved road had big concrete um, eight by eight squares with tar and when you went to town it'd go blip, 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 blip all the way to town. There was probably 6,000 of us for a long time, you know, there wasn't a lot of change. And uh, so everything was done in Brooksville. And then there were small communities like Bayport, Pine Island, Garden Grove, uh, Istachata. So you had neighborhoods and then everything else was country and you might uh, live near a neighborhood. I lived mostly in the country even though I was near Garden Grove and um, the way it shaped me was everything we did was to do with the farm so it was cycles and seasons and you learn to make do and you learn you were a renaissance person so to speak so you learn to fix or do whatever you needed to do because you know it was cost effective and it was a long ways to get parts or repair, so you had to figure it out yourself. Um, I never remember not riding a horse. I grew up on a horse because, uh, you know, the first cowboys were cow hunters, and that started in Florida. So we were cow hunters, and so you had to go herd your cows back to wherever the cow pen was, or we did cattle drives from the sand hills back to the home farm. And um, I guess one of the early stories that I remember about uh, riding a horse was, I had three older sisters, and so my papa, my grandfather, he would come by, he, his homestead was adjacent to ours, so there was like 400, 600 acres where all the family lived because you got a homestead grant. And this was in the 40s and before that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they came in the 1820s scouting and they were settled here in the 1840s. So my grandpa would come by on his big potted horse, get my diaper bag, my bottles, and put me on the back of the horse, and we'd be gone all day, you know, sometimes. So I just, I, even before I rode by myself, I was always on a horse. So that, that teaches you, you know, how to, to be in control, to make decisions, um, how to be independent, and all of those things, how to plan. Yeah. how to not get lost, <laughs> right. didn't know your way around. Um, and then if you were driving cows, uh, how to be a team player, because everybody has a role. So all of that really helped me become who I am. But everything that I did in growing up was a part of a family, uh, extended family. Um, and my sister and I, one of my sisters and I, we still do that together. We run our cattle operation together. We do Sunday dinners together. But when we did cattle drives, I mean, you know, it would might be 200 to 400 cattle because what you would do is you would take, uh, in the winter, you would take the cows out to the sand hills, which is now Spring Hill, uh, because the grass is good there in the winter but not in the summer. And then you'd bring them back home to the hammock land where we live off of Powell. And all the cattlemen have le had leases of thousands of acres. And so when you did a cattle drive, bringing them home, uh, Everybody that could ride, or that liked to ride, was on a horse. And you went out in the two or 3,000 acres that was leased, you gathered up your cattle, your portion of the cattle, and then you got them into one herd, and then we drove them. Uh, the last uh, lease that we had was where Powell Middle School is. So we would do the two or 3,000 acres around that, and um, we would drive them down uh, Powell, we would cross 41, highway patrol may or may not be there, or we would stop traffic. Wasn't, wasn't much traffic, 
But we would, so you'd have a cattle herd of anywhere from two to 300 or more cattle going down uh, Powell, cross 41, and then our first pasture was right there at the corner of 41 and uh, Powell. Open the gate and the lead cows would just all go in. How did you know which cattle were yours? Uh, they were branded and they had marks in the ears. So, oh, okay. and those are registered with the state. And so, like an uncle had a brand, my grandmother had a brand, my Papa had a brand, my father had a brand. Oh, wow. And so, you know, and you had cow pens and you, you did that when they were young. So generally they were branded and marked. Yeah, well, <laughs> when we did watermelons, you know, most of uh, the watermelon growers in this area, you would have two or 300 acres. Generally you would pay to get the land cleared. And uh, so we would start uh, work with picking up roots and rocks, <laughs> you know, and then, uh, if my older sisters were old enough to drive the tractors, even though my father had like two foremans and, and people that, a couple of people that worked year round with him. Uh, from the time that they were, we prune them after school. You, if it was watermelon season, you go to the watermelon field and you, you prune them, then you turn the vines, uh, you spray them. Then when it came time to pick, you know, you either picked, caught, drove the truck, uh, when I was young, uh, one of the things that I did was um, you, you started with box, loading them in box cars. So I was small enough still that I put a cousin and I we put the labels on the watermelon. So they pack them into the truck, into the box car, and then you put labels. Then they switched to semis, and we did the same thing. So as the years grew, your job changed on what you did during watermelon season. But we always had to work even through high school, even when I became a teacher. <laughs> You know, so when when you live on a farm, even though you have other jobs, the farm's still your way of life. It's sort of your culture of how you live. Do you feel like it's harder to keep that same type of lifestyle uh, alive because of times changing now? Well, because of times changing, you sort of have to, to, to really nurture. You can't keep the same lifestyle because, first of all, you cannot make a living farming and cattle unless you're big. However, you can still uh, nurture and, and lead that way of life. You know, so we still have cattle. It's still a family thing. Uh, when we do cows, everybody helps. Now we do ATVs, because you know, and uh, uh, all our horses are gone. And we just do the, the home farm, we don't lease. Uh, we still do Sunday dinners together. We still all go hunting together. We'll do vacations together, even though we do things apart. However, it's it's, harder to, to have that very same way of life. However, you still decide what is the culture, what's your values, what do you believe in, and those are the things that you nurture. Believe it or not, you know, back then, um, people, the first thing you want to do is to leave, you know, because it's a small town, and then you come back home. So, uh, like when I was in high school, um, I don't know that very many teachers were from here. We had some that, well, that had been here forever and that most likely somebody in your family had them, you know, because there might be two first grade teachers, two second. But what happened in the 70s and 80s, more people started entering, but when there also weren't very many openings, you know, so there wasn't a lot of opportunities. But as we grew, then there were more teaching positions. And so then there was more people from Hernando County that became teachers. And then when I was principal um, at um, Westside and then 17 years at Hernando High School, my mission was to really get homegrown. People that had gone through the school system and if they were going to be teachers is to recruit them to teach for us because it provides stability. You know, because it's not just a stopping place till they find where they want to live in Florida. I mean, yeah. if they're back in Hernando County, it's because They've chosen, this is where I want to live. And how do you think that new dynamic of the school system had uh, an overall effect on, well, the, the, the longtime residents of the county? Do you think it's something that maybe welcomed the diversity? In terms of thinking about diversity, probably didn't think about it. But, you know, when I went to school, uh, we were segregated. And, and really, you didn't think about that you were segregated because it, it was a way of life. You know, so you didn't really think about whether, whether it was right or wrong. And um, I grew up on the farm, so I was around black people. I mean, you know, we worked together, and when we worked in the watermelon fields, there were other black kids who were working with us in the watermelon field. And um, I did run into sometimes, like when I wanted to play with 
some black kids, you know, while we were waiting for whatever they'd say, well, I can't. And I'd say, why not? <laughs> kind of thing. So, you know, obviously I did not understand the difference about, you know, black schools and white schools and integration. I will say this, when we integrated in our county, um, I don't know if it was because Hernando was still small. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the problems that other people had. And I'm not saying anything was perfect, but we didn't have the riots, the fights in the lunchroom, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, uh, Quickly, we had uh, black kids on the homecoming court, elected senior uh, uh, student government president, you know, so, and, and that was by student vote. So some things were working right, you know, even though there still was a lot that needed to be done. You, you asked, like, what it was about. I mean, even though I grew up on a farm and herding, I was sort of an academic. And so when we went to school, um, I went in the new primary school, which was down the bottom of the hill. And then we went at the uh, elementary school, which is up right here where the Baptist Church was. So we could walk to the library each week to check out books. And so my mother would let me read any kind of book that I wanted to read. And every week the librarians would call, you know, because we were a small town, everybody knew everybody. And they'd call and they'd say, Miss Crum, do you know what your daughter checked out of the library? And I think finally after a month or two of that, she said, I give you permission to let my daughter check out any book she wants out of the library. And I know it drove, you know, because we were sort of old fashioned back then, you know. And I know it just drove the librarians crazy that my mother would say, she can check out any book she wants from that library. <laughs> and we had a pretty good library. Wow. Do you remember just the uh, general subject of something that they may have uh, called your mother over? Oh, I'm thing. sure it was probably romance books, or <laughs> it was probably books on politics, you know, that kind of thing. Is there thing. anything else that sticks out in your mind, like something that you may have done for fun at that point in time that you don't necessarily see kids doing anymore, or, or that you just really remember, even, uh, for example, an event that might have happened each year that you look forward to going to in town? Or, Well, back then, you know, because everything was in town, and uh, when you went to middle school pretty soon, and then high school, you, you only came to town to school because they closed the country schools. Um, so everything focused around school, and it was all fun. I mean, because when you, even when you were young, I, I was a tag along, I had three older sisters. So, you know, and it was safe back then, and there were family events. Football games were huge. Everybody would come to the football game on Friday night. When we were in the high school at the top of the hill, they would have two or three times a year, they would have, uh, well, they'd have night pep rallies on the old basketball court, and they would have a little bonfire. And so everybody on Thursday nights would, you know, go to the pep rally. I mean, families, everybody. After football games, the, we would have parties, you know, at somebody's house. And often they were at my house, because at my house on weekends, there might be anywhere from 15 to 20 people spending the night, because first of all, I had four sisters, and uh, any cousins our age spent the night, any neighbors our age spent the night, and then all our friends spent the night, because all the things that we did, you know, we rode horses, you got to drive in the field, you got to drive in the tractor, uh, we'd go right around the sand hills, or we'd all go swimming at the sandbanks, or we'd do picnics at Pine Island. But back to the, to the school, uh, often after school, uh, when I was in school, we'd go to the Frisette, you know, and hang out. What's that? That it was um, an ice cream place, and they sell sodas and whatever. And so we'd all group up and hang out there, just like kids hang out today. Now, usually, if my sisters were older, they could drive. They would leave all the younger ones, you know, in a car, <laughs> and go off with all their friends, and then come back and get us, you know, later. But you didn't think about it. Another big deal was I think it was Service League had started the teen hall. And so either Friday or Saturday night, we had dances. So we all went to the dances. So, you know, lots of people learned to dance and, and we would just hang out at the teen hall and that was great fun. But starting at about when I was in middle school, we started to get some move-ins. And then I was in high school, there was more. Then I went off to college and I came back and our, our parents, our, we had then moved our cattle lease closer in because of the Spring Hill development. And when my parents said, you know, they're going to build houses out in Spring Hill, well, the only thing you did in the Sand Hills, Spring Hill, was you hunted, you had cattle, you rode around on weekends, or you camped. 
You know, and it's like, who would live in Spring Hill? I mean, there's horse flies and it's dry, no good grass, that kind of thing. So when I went to college is when it started to, at Florida State is, and came home, it started changing. And then in the 70s, it's, it exploded. So did you become a teacher because that's what was expected of you? Or no. Because you wanted to be a teacher? <laughs> no, that's the craziest thing. That was the last thing in the world I was going to be was a teacher. So I'd gone to college and I had graduated, but my senior year at FSU, I thought, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and um, – take extra courses in at a teaching certification, so did my internship. So truly, I was uh, in my last interviews for the CIA and was going to work in Washington, D.C. And at that time, then I had started, you know, sort of dating someone seriously. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should teach a year because who's going to hire a, a teacher 40, you know, 20 years from now that's never taught? And um, so they said they'd keep my file open, you know, for what, 10 years kind of thing. So I started teaching and I got a job in Crystal River and commuted with a couple of friends to Crystal River to teach. And uh, after that, I thought, well, I like this. So I, we moved back to Brooksville and I got a job at Hernanda High. And uh, most of my life's been at Hernanda High. And um, I taught counselor, assistant principal, was principal at Westside for seven years, came back to Hernando High, and was principal there for 17 years. So that was the furthest thing from my mind was to be a teacher. I certainly wasn't going to do that, <laughs> but it was a great life. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any memories of specific major events that shaped the county? I know we talked about mm -hmm. Spring Hill exploding already, but is there anything else that you can kind of remember at any point? You know, I made a note of, uh, of some of those. Uh, first of all, sort of chronologically, when I was real little, we didn't have electricity. So uh, I remember not having electricity, but I think, you know, that was probably uh, when I was real young. And then my father worked... Uh, with a rural electric association, you know, TVA, and then that REAs came to Florida to get electricity down our road. So, you know, that, that was a significant thing. I don't remember exactly that we didn't have lights and then we did, but I remembered that, you know, that there was a period of time in my life that we had outhouses and no electric and kerosene lamps, then we have electric. Okay. Then TV came along. You know, that was sort of significant. When was that? Do you remember? Uh, that early, 50s, okay. early 50s. Early 50s. Three stations, you know, black and, black and white. Yeah. Probably the funniest thing, uh, well, the 19, uh, when I came home from college, <laughs> not a world event, but Spring Hill mm -hmm. becoming a development, that significantly changed what our county became. The other big uh, event that I remember in high school was in a chemistry class. It was during the Cuba, Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, we had this chemistry teacher, you know how kids aren't, we weren't bad, but we, we just weren't on our best behavior because this guy would get really nervous. So it was during the last days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so he was showing us a demonstration, something to do probably with helium balloons, you know, and the heat makes them move and, and whatever, and he got the flame too close to the bloom, and then it made a loud explosion. And so we evacuated, which was probably crazy. The whole school had to evacuate. We, everybody thought that the Cuban Missile Crisis, that we had been attacked, oh, you know? No. So, I mean, it wasn't funny, but, but you know, it's funny when after you think, but I mean, that's how heightened it was. And, and Florida being so close to Cuba. Probably the other major event that uh, I remember was, I was at college, and it was when Kennedy was assassinated. And you know they what they pretty did pretty much did was close down the schools, and everybody came home because you know you wanted to be with family. Um, the other significant event I remember was 9/11. I was principal at Hernando High School, and those were very strange, scary times. Um, probably the significant thing that you would notice was. It was absolutely quiet. There were no airplanes, there, and, you know, nothing flying, less traffic. Everybody really, I think, did start thinking about what's important to me, you know, who did you turn to? You turned to your family, to your churches, your community. And I think maybe that, uh, in some ways, you know, helped us become stronger in, in knowing what we believe in. In other ways, it certainly changed our life. When I became uh, elementary principal, 
I uh, won the Little Red Schoolhouse Award for top principal. Um, I won out at high school and middle at elementary level. I won the Outstanding Educator Award. And then in 1997, I became State Principal of the Year. And in 1998, I became the National Principal of the Year. And, and that all was, uh, uh, it, it included me and then I extended it to my school because without my school, that would have never happened because we were a team. So those were great, fun times. I mean, we just, we did so many significant things. Probably another significant event, local event, was when Hernando High School became 100 years old. We did a centennial celebration, and I was principal then. When was and, that? What year? Uh, 89. And when, I, when we did that, I mean, it was uh, the, uh, a big community celebration. We, uh, I had a, a team of uh, newbies and, and people that had been here forever that helped create this event. We had a, a play of uh, music through the ages that people did. We did an encore. We had a big birthday party. We had fireworks, a barbecue. Um, we did a Golden Memories book. It was a big, big deal. Thousands of people came to the fairgrounds oh, wow. for that weekend. And it was just beyond incredible. I sort of think of it before Spring Hill, even though, you know, it was starting to change before then, and our world was changing before then. So it's not really just Spring Hill that changed our county. Our world, technology, uh, the way we work, the kind of work we do, all of that changed. And then there were uh, major impacts that happened. But probably the significant feels about the county is when I was young and, and pretty much through high school, you knew all of the families around the county. I mean, you may not have known everybody, but there were probably, you know, what, 6,000 people, four to 6,000 people when I was growing up. So, you know, in, in a, even in a short lifetime, you meet a lot of people. And my dad was in politics. So, you know, I, we were around a lot of people. and. Um, so the difference of, of knowing everybody or I know your cousin's cousin kind of thing to today it's just a lot of an, uh, an anonymous feel. There's so many move-ins. They're not strong neighborhoods. Even where there are neighborhoods, people don't know their neighbors. Uh, so that's a big difference. The big difference is it's noisier. I mean, Everywhere you go, there's noise, either either from traffic, from planes, construction, you know, um, all of that kind of thing. It's noisy. Uh, the grapevine doesn't work like it used to. Used to, you could get in trouble from the grapevine, you know, because your parents would probably find out, no matter what part of the county you were in, what you had done, you know, or your aunt would be shopping in the grocery store, and you would end up on restrictions because all the boys were talking about that we were all out at the silos where none of us were supposed to be, and then you'd be on restriction. So the grapevine doesn't work as well. There are grapevines, but you know, there was like a major grapevine and everybody connected into it. I love Facebook because it's like a grapevine. And I mean, I have the range of kids that I taught, people that I grew up with, people I don't know <laughs> that knows friends of friends, and then kids that I was principal with. So it's the whole range and it's, it's a way to keep up with people that's sort of harder now, you know, keeping up with people. Um, other changes is, uh, yeah, politics. Before there was an accountability because so many people knew so many and knew so much of what was going on. Today, um, there are not those tight connections. And I know they're having to make decisions for the greater good, but sometimes you think, really? <laughs> You know, it's like, how is that even logical kind of thing? And I, and I know that they have to view it from many pictures, but um, those things have changed. As far as uh, family ties that we've talked about, mm -hmm. community ties, um, clearly you said they've changed. I like to think they've adapted or evolved. Do you think that's going to continue to happen? Do you think the, um, the older families are strong enough here in the county that they're going to keep that bit of heritage alive and available I, to future generations? I think that... Um, that many families are trying to figure ways to do that. I mean, like we do a reunion, it's not big, but it's a way to do the culture. I do think that in terms of traditions, many families try to build on the traditions that they have 
and try to stay connected. However, you know, that's not easy because it depends on what career that you choose because sometimes you can't live in a small town or in a certain part of the United States because of the career you've chosen. So you sort of have to evolve those traditions. For uh, me and one of my sisters, we really work hard at keeping that tradition of family and extended family uh, united because we believe that that's important. We believe that uh, even though we don't herd cows like we did used to in the cattle drive, we believe that um, that feeling of learning independence, learning decision making, looking at the big picture, uh, being strategic, and that how do you put strategy in play, that that's an important thing for all our children to learn. You know, to learn to be strong, to be who they want to be. I, I must admit, we weren't very diverse. Uh, Believe it or not, my eyes aren't as blue as all my cousins, <laughs> you know, and my hair was darker kind of thing. We were all blue-eyed. So I had not seen very many brown-eyed people. I had two cousins that were brown-eyed, and we thought they were strange, you know. So in terms of diverse, I mean, it started as that narrow, not, not even black and white, you know. It's like, your eyes aren't blue. Everybody I know has blue eyes. I mean, in most of the people I went to school with had blue eyes kind of thing. So we've become more diverse and, and hopefully uh, better at being more inclusive, I mean, as a family. The, many of the older families are really trying to, where do we fit in this new age and in this new age in Hernando County? Uh, church was a significant part of life. And, you know, so we all went to church um, to a church, and um, I went to the Methodist Church, you know. Spring Lake? Nope, Brooksville. Brooksville, okay. Yeah, because I'm near, I'm like south of Brooksville, off of 41. Right. And so, you know, my children grew up in the church. Um, we were married in the church. You know, we go to candlelight uh, at church there now. Uh, my parents supported the church. And, and that's just an incident of, that's what most people did. You know, and then the Baptist Church was over here behind City Hall, the, the bank parking lot. That was where the Baptist Church was. So we'd run back and forth to church. You know, we'd do MYF when sometimes we'd go to their church on Sunday night. They'd come to ours, you know, that kind of thing. So church was a major part of the fabric of our lives back then. And I know that's changed, but you, if you go to churches, you'll still see a lot of that uh, identity of a neighborhood or the county and especially um, you know the in-town churches because they did draw from everywhere so I think it's significant to think about the churches mm -hmm. in our community because they were they were a great part of uh, helping us shape us giving us activities to do you right. know Easter and there were big events Easter egg hunts uh, we would do uh, the sunrise service we did at Chinsigat, and there'd be a big passion play, and we'd all, you know, do it together. There would be like a nativity at the old hospital area, so a big thing would be to be a part of the live nativity, and then my children did that. So I think it's significant to know about the churches. Hunting was a big piece of our life. I mean, we spent, you know, if it's hunting season, we're hunting, whether it's birds, fish, deer, um, birds we'd hunt around uh, the home property mm -hmm. and the piney woods and deer you'd hunt out in the sand hills. Um, there were families that hunted in the swamplands. We didn't do that. Uh, yeah. All kinds of things happened at the airport because, you know, it was an army base. So, um, not that I ever did this, but I know that the guys my age did it and then I know uh, the kids older than me did this. They must have been wilder than my group was. Uh, they used to have drag races at the airport and uh, they weren't supposed to. But they did it regularly. And then from that, Don Gartlets, you know, that broke the speed record for the dragsters, would be, they would have races every Sunday out at the airport for, it must have been a few years. So we would go, and all of, all of Hernando County would go, but I mean, they'd come from everywhere. And so we all got to see Don Gartlets break that record. Oh, so wow. that was a significant yeah. thing, and that was a fun thing to do. And where do you see the county going from here? Clearly, you're aware of what's going on and analyzing things as you go. Um, <laughs> um, so, so what do you think? By the 80s, and even more so, we're suburban uh, from Brooksville West. We're suburban, but we're not suburban to a city. 
you know, I mean, but our way of living is subdivisions and shopping centers, much like if you were in the suburbs of a city. And so uh, what I worry about, that there's going to be more of that, which means less identity for what the county is, less connections, um, harder for people to stay informed of what is making their voice known for what's important or even paying attention to it. I think the other thing that's uh, difficult is how do you meet the needs? Because I don't think that we have a handle on what do we want Hernando County to be? And are we nudging it, pushing it, pulling it in that direction? And I'm not saying it should be what it was, because that can never be. However, we can control what it becomes. And are we doing that? And I think that when we do that, I think we should do it in terms of how much nature do we have left? How much opportunity do we offer for our young people and our older people? And then what do we do as a government to efficiently provide services? And, and what are the services? I mean, just because you had something somewhere else, does that mean that it's needed here? And can we afford it? So I really worry about our growth. And is it thought out? And is there the, do we know what we want the identity of the county to be?